Hello and welcome to Module 7 of our Core Python Programming course by Mission AI. Right In the previous module, we covered a whole bunch of concepts like list comprehensions, dictionary and set comprehensions, iterators, and generators, and so on. Right In this module, we're going to look at errors and exceptions. Right Now, you know that uh, there's a lot of cases in general programming where, you know, uh, like somebody might specify an input that we don't expect or there might be some data that is missing or the file will be in some wrong format, right? And all these things are, are a part of day-to-day -day life, right? It happens and you can't do much about it. But what you can do is you can make your code better and smart enough to handle these exceptional circumstances. So uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Python errors and exceptions how they get generated and why they get generated, then how we can catch them and handle them, right? So the, the good thing about Python is, like when you get an error, it might seem like a random bunch of code, but it's actually really, really informative, right? It shows you the type of error, which gives you like an idea about the root cause. It also gives you an explanatory message and shows you exactly where the error occurred. Right? There's a small upward arrow that it shows that indicates the exact location of the error. And if there are multiple errors encountered, then Python will show you the instance or rather the location of the first error. Right? And once you resolve that error, then it moves to the second error and so on. All the way till the end of the program and once all your errors are resolved, it runs fine. Right? Now, I want you to think about like two separate cases right now i've told you in the past that what python does is if it detects a change in your source code right then it creates this in in all cases we have to have an intermediate representation of your program like we are writing it in plain english and we're writing it in a way that we understand right but it has to be translated into machine readable code and Python does that for us automatically in the background, right? It creates an intermediate representation, right? Now, that's the first step. And the second step is that intermediate representation is then run as part of the program execution, right? So, if, for example, I make a mistake in the syntax of my code, then in the process of taking what I have written and converting it to the intermediate representation, Python throws an error, right? There's an error in the syntax of the program. And this is called a passing error. So, so that's st stage one, right? That's a stage one error. And that's what you call a syntax error. Like there's an error in like the language that I'm trying to speak to Python. Incorrectly written code, right? The other type of exception is something where the syntax is correct, but during runtime, that is when the code is actually running, uh, it misbehaves or behaves in a way that we do not understand, right? Or some exceptional circumstance occurred that caused it to behave differently from what we expect. And that's a runtime exception that gets thrown up, okay? So I'll cover the, the runtime exceptions next, but for now, I'll just show you the simple syntax errors that you are likely to encounter in your journey of writing Python code. So, in this particular case, right, I have included three syntax errors, right, and we need to correct them one by one. So, if I run this code as it is, Python throws an error, right? The first thing it will tell me is that I'm trying to perform an assignment operation where I should be actually supplying a condition. So, single equal to is the assignment operator and double equal to is the equality operator. So, and I actually intended on, on passing the equality operator here, right? So, I change it from one equal to to two equal to, right? So, now if I run it again, the first error is resolved and Python then says there's another error at the end of this line, right? So, basically, I'm missing the colon at the end of the if condition. So, let me add that colon, right? Now, if I run it here, it throws up another error, right? Basically saying that it expected an indented block. I told you whenever there's an if or an else or a for loop or anything, the code inside that, that particular construct, like the if condition, has to be indented by one tab, right? Uh, 
So this print statement actually should have been indented by one tab or four spaces and been a part of the if block, like so. And if I run this final thing, it runs fine and uh, there's no error, right? Now I told you this is a syntax error, right? But when I run this last thing over here, it throws something called an indentation error, okay? And the reason for that is indentation error is basically a subclass of syntax error. Uh, we'll be covering object-oriented programming in the next module, but what this statement basically means is that indentation error is a specific type of syntax error. So it still comes under syntax errors. And if I run this statement, the is subclass function with indentation error as the subclass that I'm checking for and syntax error as the base class or superclass, then it returns true, right? Okay, so let's correct this code ourselves step by step and get to uh, code that runs successfully, right? So if I run it now using control enter, you can see that first it's told me the kind of error, right? It's a syntax error and it says invalid syntax. Now it says in this particular file on line two. Now line two is here, but no, actually this is line two, right? Line one is where the comment is and line two is where this code is. And it even has this upward arrow here pointing to where the error was. And it's right below the equal to sign, right? Which basically means that I'm trying to do an assignment operation here when in fact I wanted to do an equality check. So I'll add an equal to sign. So let's run it again now. Now you can see the position of this. It's on the same line, but the position of this upward arrow has changed to the end of this line, which is basically going to tell me that I've missed my colon, right? Now let me run it again. Control enter. Now it says there's an indentation error, right? Expected an indented block and this is in line three. The previous errors were in line two. So over here, it's telling me that my code should have been indented, right? So I'll press the tab uh, button on the tab key on the keyboard and now I get an indented uh, line of code uh, which forms part of the if block. So if I run this, now it should run successfully, right? There we go. We have this value printed correctly. So one equal to one is the equality is checked correctly. I've specified the end of the if condition and beginning of the if block correctly and I've indented that code in the if block. And if I run this particular statement is subclass it should basically give me true, right? Telling me that indentation error is a type of syntax error. It returns true. Cool, so let's do a couple of exercises here. We need to correct the syntax errors one by one in the following code by looking at the error messages. So I'll select this entire code and uncomment it using control slash. And this is forward slash, right? And if I want to comment it out again, I can do control forward slash again and undo it using control forward slash again. So basically it's like a toggle, right? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this first just to find out where the errors are. So control enter to run. It says invalid syntax on line six. Now, which is line six? This is one, two, three, four, five and six. So basically in my first line of code here, there is an error and it's pointing to the equal to sign, right? So basically I'm again trying to perform assignment where I should have been checking for equality. So I'll add the second equal to sign and I'll run this again, right? Now the position of this arrow has moved. It's still a syntax error. It's still on line six, but now it's pointing to this not equal to, right? And if you remember the not equal to operator has two characters. In this case, I've passed three. So I need to remove this third, this equal to sign and this not equal to is now correct. If I run it again, the syntax error arrow points to the end of the line, right? Which basically means that it's after the if condition, which means I need to specify the colon over here. Let me run it again. In this case, the errors move to line seven, right? Which is here. And it's saying there's an indentation error. I expected an indented block. Uh, 
So it means that this is part of the if block and I need to indent it by one tab. So I'll press tab and now run it again. Right? So it says there's a problem in here somewhere. Now obviously there's a problem here because I should pass a string right, to this print function. I've just passed a bunch of words that were not enclosed in a string. So Python didn't understand the previous input. So now if I run it, so this part basically runs fine, right? Now we've gotten to the else part and it's found a syntax error here, right? And the arrow points to just after the else, basically indicating that I missed the colon over here. Let me run it again. Now it moves to line 9, which is this line, and it says indentation error. So this is a part of the else block in Python. So I need to indent it by one tab. Let me run it again. And this is the message that gets printed, right? So this condition evaluates to true, and this gets printed. And if I had changed this value over here, then this would get printed. Basically, irrespective of what gets printed, the fact is something is getting printed, which means we have corrected all the syntax errors, right? We're not vouching for the behavior of this program. All we're vouching for is that there are no syntax errors. The intermediate representation is getting created correctly and the program is getting a chance to run, okay? I'll just change it back to the original value here and run it again. And this first message gets printed. So I hope you've understood about syntax errors, indentation errors, and what I've shown you are generally the most common places that mess, that errors pop up, right? This equality operator, missing colon, and, <coughs> excuse me, missing indentation. Cool, so let's, uh, and also sometimes people don't like enclose strings in quotes. So that is another cause of errors. Cool. Now let's move on to exceptions, right? I told you there's one set of errors that we'll classify as syntax errors, which means that the, the code itself contains a mistake, right? Like a syntax error. So the Python interpreter is not able to parse what we've written. Now in the second case of an exception, the Python interpreter can parse the, the syntax that we've written, it can it creates this intermediate representation correctly, but during the run the running of the program, it throws an error. So it's basically called a runtime exception. Okay, that means that it's syntactically correct, but the behavior has gone along unexpected lines and it breaks some rules. Right? Like this typically happens in a few cases where we are asking the user for some input, and we just assume they are going to provide the right kind of input. Or if we're assuming that, let's say, some data structure contains certain number of values, but it, let's say it has missing or empty values, right? Uh, this is typically when exceptions occur, right? And there are four main types of exceptions that we will look at. So the first one is a type error, then there's value error, then there's name error and zero division error, right? In that, the zero division error, I think, is... Uh, very self-explanatory. Name error is also very self-explanatory. This type and value error, I think we need to deep dive a little bit just so that you understand which one occurs when, right? Cool. So let's now look at the section on type error. Now, a, a type error is thrown when an operation or function, just think about it, I'm applying an operation to an object of an incompatible type. Right now, we have already seen this happen before. You remember, I told you, right? Like when we are doing print and we're trying to concatenate a string with an integer without converting this integer to a string, then effectively I'm trying to add an int to a string or I'm trying to concatenate an int with a string, which basically they're incompatible types. So Python throws a type error, right? Similarly, if I try to find the length using the len function of a float, that doesn't make sense, right? The 
len function expects an iterable it expects a collection it expects a data type that can hold one or more values right it could be like a string it could be a list it could be a tuple it could be a dictionary a set whatever but it cannot be a float so i'm passing an incompatible type to this function right now over here for example i'm trying to say i'm dividing the string by 2 maybe what i thought was it will give me only the first half of the string i don't know but basically it's division is an incompatible operation for a string like there is no predefined operation called division for a string right so it's an unsupported operation between a string and an int and finally i'm trying to print out this list right but we know that the list constructor takes only one argument and that argument has to be an iterable right an iterable is basically i told you yesterday we covered it in module 6 right so an iterable is basically an object like loosely speaking it's it's like a collection it can hold multiple values but technically speaking it has an iter method which returns an iterator to the iterable right but one is an integer which is not an iterable so we are passing an incompatible type to the list constructor function so it throws a type error so in all these cases we are either passing an argument of the wrong type to a function or we're trying to perform an incompatible operation an operation between incompatible types so i'll just copy all these statements and i'll run them one by one right and i'll keep uncommenting uh, successively so if i say print high student number and i say plus 5 it should throw a type error right because string plus integer makes no sense so python doesn't understand it And this is where you understand that Python implements strong typing, right? So strong typing means that certain operations between incompatible types are not allowed, right? It's better to throw an exception than to not throw an exception and do some unexpected behavior. So here we can see that can only concatenate string, not an integer to string. So if I convert this to, let's say, str, right using the string constructor function and i run it now i get the right answer so string plus string is allowed string plus int is not allowed if we run that operation we get a type error now let's uncomment the second line len of 100.55 right where we know that the len function basically needs a a collection or an iterable and float is and uh, so a float object has no concept of length right it just has a value if i run it now i get a type error object of type float has no len uh, method or function so what i would do in this case is i would enclose it within a list right so i have a list containing one float value called len and if i run this now the length of that list is one now let me uncomment the third line right this is a string and i divide it by two that operation makes no sense right so either i have to say uh, i change the division to multiplication and i run it and it gets repeated twice or if i wanted only the first half of the string i can do something like uh, i can slice this string right and i can say from zero to len uh, let me just assign this string to a variable first so i'll say s equal to this string and then i can say print s of 0 to len of s divided by 2 and i convert that to an integer so if i run it now I get the first half of the string right which is like seven characters it's this much and the other seven characters are the second half of the string so i might have wanted to do something like this but i ended up saying print string divided by two right so i have to basically convert it to an uh, like pass the right kind of arguments to the right kind of function 
And finally, let me uncomment this last line. Print list of one. This makes no sense because uh, one is an integer and it's not an iterable and I need to pass an iterable to the list function. So if I had passed it as a string, then it would have run fine, showing you that there was a type error and now uh, there is no type error. Okay. So just to reiterate, a type error is thrown when I try to either pass an incompatible type of argument to a function or I try to perform an operation between incompatible types. Now let's move on to the second thing which is a value error, right? Now a value error is thrown when like, so think about it as a sequence, right? First the type is checked, right? And if that part is sorted, now the next thing we look at is I've passed an argument of the right type, but the it has an unacceptable value, right? So if I have, let's say, a function that, that expects, uh, like I take some input from a user, right? And I ask the user to input a number, and that input function basically stores the user input as a string, right? And I pass a string to this integer con constructor function. Now, the string is an acceptable input to this int function, right? But if that string contains anything other than a number or anything other than an integer, then we throw an error, right? It's a value error. So in a sense, int of 21 as a string is okay, but int of cat is not okay, right? So in both cases, the input is a string, but the contents of that object are what matter. So it, we're basically saying type is okay, but value is wrong. Now you look at this list here, right? Now in the second case, I'm trying to perform an operation on a value that does not exist, right? Like the list contains three objects, one, two, and three, but I'm trying to remove the object or the item four, right? Now four is not contained in this list. So Python throws a value error saying that value four does not exist in the list. And finally, I could also have a case where uh, I've shown you, right? I can like unpack a tuple and assign its individual values to variables, right? Now, in the tuple, I should have three values because I am assigning three variables to that tuple, right? But in this case, there are only two values. So it throws a value error because the number of values being unpacked is incorrect. So let's run these one by one. So if I run the first uh, statement, right? Let me type 21, right? So what happens is that input function returns the string 21 to the int function. And int can successfully convert the string 21 into the integer 21, which then gets printed, right? So 21 gets printed. But if I pass something else, right, which is not an integer, let's say I pass, uh, 20 in as a string, then it throws a value error, right? Or even if I pass a float, it throws a value error. Basically saying invalid literal for the int function, which means invalid value passed to the int function. So let's comment that out and uncomment the second line of code. Now I have this list that's running, right? Uh, this list with three values, one, two, and three, and I'm trying to remove the value four. So it says list dot remove x is not in list, right? So I can either do, I can add four to the list, in which case it runs fine, or I can remove a value which is already in the list. Let's say I say one, two, three of remove three, and it runs fine, right? There's no error thrown. So the value error has been corrected. Now let me comment that out and uncomment the third line. Now, in this case, I'm trying to assign three variables to the values, individual values, items in the tuple. But the tuple only contains two values. So there's a mismatch, right, in the items being unpacked. So it throws a value error. Expected three got two, right? So either I can say, add a value to this tuple and it runs fine. Or I can say, if the original tuple cannot be changed, I will assign only two variables, x and y, and it runs fine. So you've seen where a value error gets thrown, right? It's basically because 
it's potentially the right type of argument but an unexpected value right uh, like for example if we pass a string to an int which is allowed but the string contains anything other than an integer or if we try to remove a value from a list when that value is not in the list or if we try to assign an incorrect number of variables to the values of a tuple okay so we've seen type and value error this is the these are the two most i would say complex types in terms of understanding the root cause of an error the next two are really straightforward right so name error means like i've incorrectly specified the name of the object which basically means either it does not exist or i have misspelled something so if i look here right print len of variable a now i have not created the variable a anywhere right so it's not in the runtime environment so python throws an error saying i can't find a a has not been defined in the second case i'm saying print of 10 and i've obviously misspelled the print function name right so it throws a name error i'll run both these and i'll show you now in the first case if I run it, I say print len of a, right? Oh, sorry, a, I, I had run this code previously, so a has been defined. So let me create a variable called a b, right? Print len of a b. Now it throws an error, name error, saying name a b is not defined. I basically not created any variable called a b, right? So if I say a b equal to 1, or I'll say a string value 1, then it should print this value just fine. And now it will throw an error from this line. So if I run it, here we go. This first value gets printed fine. And the second, the last line throws an error, right? Saying the name print is not defined. So I just need to change this to print. And now it runs just fine. So we've seen that the name error happens when either I refer to a variable that has not been defined or I misspell the name of a variable or, or a keyword or a function. And finally, there's a zero division error, right? And the zero division error occurs when I, I'm performing a division operation and uh, the, the divisor, that is the denominator, is zero. So if I paste that here, you can see that I'm doing this division one divided by A, but A has the value zero. So I so basically one divided by zero is infinity, right? And we that's an invalid undefined value so we cannot pass that to the string function so if i run it here it says zero division error so those are the four main types of errors that we look at type error value error name error and zero division error let's do exercises now so modify the following statements so that they don't throw a type error right use control slash to uncomment the code so let's say i uncomment all these three lines at once right now the first line should throw an error because i'm trying to perform an illegal or rather i'm performing a valid operation between incompatible argument types like string plus integer makes no sense right so if i run it it throws a type error on this line right saying can only concatenate string to string so i'll just change it to its string representation using this str function now if i run it the first message gets printed fine right so the first line has been corrected now the second line is throwing an error and it's throwing the same type error saying unsupported operand types for divide that is divide can only work between numeric types and not a string and a integer so how do i correct that let me just change this to uh, multiply right for simplicity's sake and i'll get the the message test repeated three times so here we go test 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 now the error thrown is from the last line over here right which is indicated using this arrow it says type error int object is not iterable so I'm trying to pass a non-iterable value into the uh, list constructor function. So what I should do instead is just make it an iterable by like enclosing it in double quotes so it becomes a string. 
And I'm not saying like this is how you always solve these errors. I'm just saying in this particular case, I'm showing you the reason why this error popped up and I'm showing you a quick fix that I can take to make sure that this particular error does not pop up. But it doesn't mean that my program is running correctly just because I changed two to a string, right? You'll have to do what's right for your program. So we've corrected the type errors, right? So now let's correct value errors. So print int of cat. Now that makes no sense, right? Uh, because int can take a string, but it cannot take a string containing letters. It can only take a string that, that contains an integer. So if I run this without making any corrections, it shows an error on this same line that we've identified. And it says invalid literal for the int function. So if I change this to something like 35, right? It runs correctly. So the value 35 gets printed. Now it throws a value error from the second line, which is here, right? This line, basically saying that the value 40 is not in the list. So I can add 40 to the list and remove it. Or what I can also do is something like if first I'll assign this list thing to a variable. So I'll say L equal to 10, 20, 30 and say if 40 in L, right? Then I'll say L dot remove 40. So in a way, I'm kind of taking care of a few uh, edge conditions. And what I can do is at the end, I can say print L just to show you that it's run correctly, right? So it runs correctly with these three values remaining. This part does not run because 40 is not present in L. Now, if it was present in L, it would have run correctly still, right? Because only three values will be remaining at the end. And the error that's thrown is from the last line. And that's because there's an incorrect, there's a mismatch in the number of values of the tuple and the number of variables that I've specified. So I can just remove the third variable from here and I get X and Y and the whole thing runs fine. So all three value errors have been corrected. Okay, moving on to the, the name error part now. Let me uncomment these lines. So I have no variable called A1, or at least I don't remember if I've defined a variable called A1. So that's what should throw an error. No, it turns out I have defined A1. So let me print len of A2, right? And it says name of A2 is not defined. So this is an undefined variable. So if I say instead A2 equal to test, and now I run it, I get the value of length, uh, the value of len of A2, which is four, okay? So these two statements have run correctly and the error thrown is in the last statement and it says the name print is not defined. So I just need to add the T here and make it the print function. And now the whole code block runs fine. So we've seen how to correct type errors, value errors and name errors. And finally, we look at modifying this code block so that it doesn't throw a zero division error. So I have a list with three values. I'm iterating through each item in the list and I'm printing the reciprocal of that element, right? And this is a normal operation. You'd expect to do something without errors, but you didn't know that the list contained a value of zero. So if I run it now, the first two items get run fine and the message gets printed correctly. In the third iteration, it throws an error when it encounters one divided by zero, right? And it shows that this is the line where it got encountered. So how would I do that, right? I would just check for the value, right? And if the value is zero, I don't perform this operation. So if I not equal to zero, I go ahead and perform this operation. Otherwise, I don't do anything. So if I equal to zero, I don't do anything. If I run it now, it runs correctly and does not throw a zero division error. So I've shown you now in this section the four most common types of errors, runtime errors, and we've seen how to correct them, right?
So let's see what happens now if uh, I have to start handling exceptions, okay? Which means that I'm now beginning to add this level of intelligence to my program where I know that I'm trying to achieve tasks A, B, and C. Now, A can have these kinds of issues, B can have those kinds of issues, and C will never throw any issues, okay? So then I have to handle those errors that tasks A and B can throw up. Okay, so how do I do that, right? I do that using try except, right? Uh, just before that, let me tell you. So there is a base class, okay? And again, we look at what a class is in uh, the next section on object-oriented programming. But just know that there is a base, like the, the foundational thing called the exception class. And all the things that we've seen over here, right from syntax errors to indentation errors to uh, type, value, name, and zero division errors, all of them are descendants of that exception class, okay? They all derive from that exception class. They're all specific versions of the exception class, okay? So, uh, the generic type is just called exception. That's this value. And then everything else we've seen like value error, type error, etc. is a specific type of exception. So if, for example, you don't want to, you don't care about the type of error that you get, but you just care that it throws an error, then all you do is dump your code into a try block. And in the accept block, you just handle the generic exception object, right? So try and accept is very much like, as in structure-wise, it's like if and else, right? You have the try keyword. There's no condition here. There's just a try keyword followed by a colon. Then you have this indented block of code where you feel like more often than not, it will not throw an error. But if something is off, like for example, the database is down, then it might throw an error, right? Or an exception. So how do you handle that exception? You handle it in this accept clause. Now in this accept clause, if you don't specify the type of exception that you are handling, then it handles all possible exceptions, okay? You can also specify a single exception type or you can specify multiple exception types or you can specify no exception types, okay? So if for example, I'm allowed to specify just one exception type, then I can specify an accept block or an accept clause for let's say type error, right? Similarly, I can have a second accept clause for a value error. I can have a third accept clause for a name error. And then I can have a fourth accept clause, which is a generic clause that handles all other type of exceptions that do not get caught in the first three accept blocks, right? Then there is something called else. Uh, else is basically, see now, else and finally, you're not going to use them more often. More often than not, you're not going to be using them, okay? But you need to know what they are. So if I use else over here, just like in the case of the while loop, else basically means, in this case, the code that must be executed if the try block doesn't throw an exception, okay? So I'm running the try, the code inside the try block, right? If it throws an exception, then the code in the accept block gets executed. If it doesn't throw an exception, then the code, the next bunch of code that gets executed is in the else block. Now the finally block is like all the cleanup code that you want to write before exiting, right? Like for example, if in here you've handled, you've opened a file, right? Now in the finally block, you should close the file before exiting. And irrespective of whether the code ran successfully or not, the finally block will get executed. Okay, so there's a try block containing a block of code indented. And there's an accept block that looks for exceptions. And it has a block of code that is indented. There is an else block whose block of code gets executed only if the try block of code gets executed successfully without throwing an exception. And then there's the finally block, which gets executed irrespective of whether an execution is thrown or not, uh, an exception is thrown or not. So if try ran successfully, then else would get executed after that. And then finally would get executed after that. If try ran unsuccessfully, 
that is it through an exception then the code in the except clause gets run the code in else does not get run and the code in finally does get run okay so just reiterating these notes that we made it isn't necessary to specify the types of exceptions we are catching right if we don't specify the type of exception we are catching then all we have is one except block that handles all types of exceptions now we can have multiple except blocks where each block handles a different kind of exception right and there can be one generic except block at the end to handle exceptions that haven't been explicitly stated and within an except block we can have multiple types of exceptions that can be caught or handled right like for example i put brackets and i put types of exceptions so i can handle i can specify multiple exception types in here now the else block is only for statements that must be executed only if the try block executes without an exception so you think about it like only if the try block executes successfully you would want to execute the else block right so if in try we are trying to open a file then in else we can put the code to read the file the contents of the file and the finally clause is not necessary but it's used to typically specify clean up actions like closing a database connection closing a file and so on okay now let's look at some code examples in this first example is a basic try and accept right so i'm i have this code that runs and irrespective of what kind of error that code might throw i have a single accept block that just prints out a error message okay so i'll if i copy this and i run it here right right at the bottom so i if i run it sorry control enter it prints out the message this doesn't produce an exception because it's just a simple print statement right but let's say i comment that out and i uncomment the next line print len of 10 right now len of 10 will throw an error right and it will throw a type error because 10 is an incompatible type to the len function so now the except clause gets activated it catches this exception which is a type error but it doesn't it doesn't depend on which type of error it catches all it does is it prints this uh, statement so if i run it now you can see that this print statement has been executed which means that we had entered the except block right which means that the code in the try uh, block through an error so this is how try and accept works if try runs fine except does not get executed but if try throws an exception then except gets executed now let's move on to the second example right we have a try we have an except and we have a finally now in this case the the code we are running in the try block will not throw an exception it's just a simple print statement right so the except block and we have only one except block will not get executed this code will not get printed but there is a finally block where we are printing a message and this will get executed irrespective of whether there was an exception thrown or not so ideally we should see this getting printed successfully it reaches the end of this try block without throwing an error so except does not get executed and the finally block gets executed so we should see two print statements run that's exactly what we get we get this value from here and because this ran successfully this does not get executed and then we get this value from here which is printed right at the end irrespective of whether an exception was thrown or not okay so you seen how try accept and finally work now let's move on to the third type of example right this is more interesting because i'm showing you like the full range of features of try and accept so i have a try block right there's a bunch of code here in the first accept block i'm catching only name errors right and if the name error is caught i'm printing a message which is specific for that name error in the second accept block i'm catching two types of errors which i'm specifying within brackets 
one is a value error and one is a type error and if i enter this except block i am printing out this particular message right then i have a third except block where i'm not specifying the type of exception being caught which means that this is like a catch all right this is the generic except clause where if i don't enter this and i don't enter this and an exception is thrown then i enter this block and this is the message that gets printed for all types of except exceptions other than name error value error and type error and then there's a finally block that gets executed irrespective of what happens in these other blocks so if i run it now you can see that i printed this line right at the beginning of the try block i printed this line at the end of the try block right it ran successfully so none of these except clauses get triggered right none of the code blocks get executed and then we get to the finally part and this message gets printed which is here okay now let me start uncommenting these lines one by one and i'll show you what else gets executed now i'll say print len of 10 right and this is a type error quite obviously because i'm passing the wrong type to the len function so if it throws an error from here, from this line it means that it straight away goes into the except blocks without printing this line right so this line at the end of the try block will not get executed instead since it throws a type error it should come to this except block because that's where we're catching the type error and it will print this message and then finally it will print this message so that's what i expect expect to see so here you can see what's happened it printed this first line over here and from now on let's just assume that line is always going to get printed right now it threw an error here so the control went straight into this except block where it printed this value this is the code in the except block for value and type error right which is exactly what we got over here and then it goes to the finally part and from now on let's assume that finally is going to also get executed irrespective of what happens so i showed you how multiple exception types can be specified and handled and in this case we handle the type error right so let me comment that line out and then uncomment the next line now this line throws a value error right because we are performing an operation on a value that does not exist in this list so now if i run it the first line printed as usual last line printed as usual but it goes straight into this block again because i'm handling value error and type error in the same except block so i get the same message as last time now let me comment this out and uncomment the third line here now let's say i refer to a variable a3 that does not exist right so it should throw a name error and since it throws a name error that gets handled in this first except block and this message gets printed this one so let me run it and you can see that this is what happens this is the name error message right because the value a3 does not exist it does not know what this name refers to so i'll comment that line and i'll now uncomment the line that throws a zero division error right one divided by zero is infinity and that throws a zero division error so let's run it and it goes neither in here nor in here so it basically goes in here in this generic clause which is the catch all right for all other exceptions other than name error value error type error so i could have also said something like exception and it should show the same same uh, output right because exception is like the uh, foundation base class that all these specific exceptions derive from so this is the code in the except block for all other exceptions that haven't been specified this is the message that gets printed for this zero division error so you see now how we can specify an except block with one type of error being looked for 
you've seen how we can specify it for multiple types of error being looked for in brackets and then you can specify a generic catch-all block uh, that executes if the accept blocks before that have not been executed remember in any case only one accept block will get executed okay at most What's in the try will always get executed until the error is thrown and what's in the finally will always get executed, no exceptions. So let's do, uh, oh wait, there's one final example here. Just to show you again, kind of reiterate uh, what gets printed and when, right? So I have a print try, right, which runs successfully. It's just a simple print statement. So except does not execute else will execute because try executed successfully and finally will execute because it always gets executed so if i run this now i can see that try else and finally have run and except has not run right now let me comment that first line inside try and uncomment the second line so i'm trying to print try plus one which is an invalid operation it's a type error so that should send me into the accept clause, right? So nothing gets printed from try. The accept does get printed. The else does not get entered into because try did not run successfully. And then finally gets entered into because we always enter the finally block. There you can go. We've only got accept and finally, right? So you know when ex when try gets fully executed, you know when accept gets executed, you know when else gets executed, and you know when finally gets executed. Going to the exercise now. So write a function that uses list comprehensions to generate a list of squares of the first 10 positive integers. Right. So let's say I have this function called def uh, list of squares, right? List squares underscore 10. Right? doesn't take any arguments and let's just say it returns I'm going to return this list comprehension where I want the squares of the first 10 positive integers so I'll just say num square num to the power of 2 which is the output expression space for num in range 1 comma 11 which is the iteration and there's no filter right so all I'm doing is I'm returning this simple list and I'm going to call this from the main function, right? Print list underscore squares underscore 10. And I'm going to call that function. So you can see that this entire list is printed, right? So within that function, if there is a value error, print this message, right? So now what I'll do is I'll move this to a try block indent it and then i'll start writing my accept blocks so if there is a value error print the message there is a value error so accept value error and this is the message that i want so i can say print this is a value error right if there is a type or zero division error print this message and throw the exception so okay i'll show you how to throw the exception later but for now let me just write the accept clause with type error or zero division error right and in this accept clause i'm going to print out this particular message and i'm just going to use the raise keyword right so whatever exception got caught over here it is raising re-raising the same exception Now, for any other type of exception, print the message, some other exception was thrown. So, I'll say accept, and I don't need to specify anything else over there, and I'll print this statement. 
Now, if the try code runs successfully, print the message the try ran successfully. And where do we put this? We put this in the else clause, right? Because this runs only if the try runs successfully. And at the end of this code, I want this message printed irrespective of whether it was successful or not. So I'll have a finally block, right? And I'll print this message. So I'm doing all these things here and I'm calling the same function, right? So if I run it now, none of these things ran, right? And else did not get executed because I had a return I had a return function, right? So uh, a return keyword. So return basically sends this value back and also sends control back. But interestingly enough, you can see that the finally got executed in spite of a return being present over here, right? So just know that irrespective of what happens, even if there is a return statement, finally will still get executed. So what I could have done here was, instead of saying return over here, I'll just say x equal to this list comprehension and right at the end of this function, I'll say return x. Okay. Uh, but actually what happens is if there was an error in here, then return x would never get executed right so instead of that i'll just i'll just put it over here and uh, if i run this now i get the same output right so i have looked for a value error i have looked for type and zero division error and in this case i've re, re raised that exception and i've also uh, looked have a gen generic catch-all accept clause where I print some custom message. I have an else clause and I have a finally clause. So basically I have every possible clause I could want right in here. And in this case, our calculation is correct and it does not throw a message. But if I had done something, for example, len of num, right? I'm passing an incompatible type. So it will throw a type error and this is what should get printed and then it gets re-raised. So if I run it, you can see that it's thrown a type error, right? Object of type int has no len. And you can see that it got thrown from here. That is where this list comprehension was defined. So now the accept clause gets uh, executed, the one for the type error. So if I change it back to the original thing, it runs just fine. Here, right? Cool. So that brings us to the end of this uh, part where we are handling exceptions, right? So we've seen what a try block is. We've seen the accept block. We've seen the else block and the finally block. Now, finally, we look at the part on raising exceptions, right? What do I mean here? Like, what I mean is there are instances where we might want to raise an exception proactively, right? Maybe, like, let's say within our company, the best practice is if uh, there is a function, right, to insert a new user into the database. And... Uh, this function opens a database connection, it runs an insert statement, and it closes the connection. And let's say the database connection is unavailable, right? Maybe the, the correct kind of behavior for your function is to throw an exception saying connection refused or something. And then the other developer who's writing code to handle that operation could handle it in his code. Like he could say, try your function. And in the accept clause, he could say connection error, right? So we've seen how to handle exceptions. In this case, we're seeing how to raise exceptions. So what you use is you use the raise keyword followed by optionally the exception type and in brackets, a custom message 
if you have a custom message right another way to throw an exception if a condition is not met is to use the assert statement right so assert basically checks if the condition is true if it's not true it throws an assertion error with this custom message okay so let's just look at the scenario if the value a is greater than 100 throw an exception with the message value cannot exceed 100 right so what i'm doing is i'm asking the user to input a number between 1 and 100 right now that input always stores the user input as a string so we need to convert it to an integer right and let's assume that the user correctly enters a number but let's say that he enters a number that is like minus 10 or 110 which is not between 0 and 100 so what we're going to do is we're going to check if a greater than 100 then raise a new value error with the message value cannot exceed 100 okay and that has to be handled somewhere separately similarly what i can also do is i can convert this user input into an integer store it in the variable a and i can assert that a less than or equal to 100 right which is the condition that i want and if a is not less than or equal to 100 that is a greater than 100 then I can say value cannot exceed 100 that is the custom message that is in embedded within the assertion error okay assertion error is what gets thrown so I'll run both these cases and I'll show it to you so here in the first case let me uh, enter a value 110 right so it's it's greater than 100 so if i enter that i've told python to raise a value error with this message so in value error here you see value cannot exceed 100 and it points to the line where i've raised the value error and this is the custom message that i passed to the value error constructor so let's say this part ran fine right now i go to the next part which is assert right so if i run this it checks if the value is less than or equal to 100 so i'll, I'll enter 150 right and it throws an assertion error with this custom message value cannot exceed 100 and the line at which it throws it is the where it concern uh, contains the assert statement so you've seen how to throw an error uh, proactively using the raise keyword you've also seen how to throw an error using the assert keyword right the only difference is in this case when you throw raise when you use raise you can throw an exception of the type that you want if you use assert the the type of exception that gets thrown is an assertion error okay now let's look at another case where an exception is thrown but it doesn't describe the underlying cause accurately enough like for example let's say python put some random message into your uh, exception right so then what you'd want to do is you'd want to uh, throw a new exception with a specific custom message so that the user understands what exactly you're saying so over here what i do is i'm catching the exception right so like for example i try to execute this print statement and if i did not enter a number over here then converting it to an int would basically throw an error right and then this whole thing throws an error and it gets uh, sent to the accept clause but in that previous error we might have had a message that we didn't really understand well right so what we'll then do is we'll catch that error and raise a new exception with a custom message so if i go here and i run that code i'll ask the user to enter a number let's say i enter cat right so this part throws an error and let's see what happens actually uh, 
it's thrown a generic exception right with this message over here and basically saying that this exception was thrown during the handling of this exception which was the value error right which got thrown when uh, i passed a text input an incorrect text input to the int function now you can see that this message would not have made that much sense perhaps and hence we've thrown a generic exception with this message so what python does in this case is it caught one one type of exception and it raised a different kind of exception now what it's telling us is this exception was raised during the handling of this first exception which was the value error okay so what i've done is i've taken the original exception and in the except block i have raised a new exception with a descriptive uh, message now the second solution would be catch this exception right and to the same exception i add a more descriptive custom message so just to let you know that every exception object has an args attribute now i have already shown you how to like what attributes and methods are right so if ve is the object then ve.args is an attribute of that object and in this case args is the name of the attribute and it is a tuple right so it basically is a tuple of all the arguments that were passed to the exception and typically what gets passed to the exception during creation it's only the message that we want to show the user right that's the error message so what i'm doing in this case is i'm assigning ve.args a new value right so what happened here is there was a print statement and let's say i pass an incorrect input to this int function python throws an error right so python wrapped an a particular message inside a value error and it raised that exception right now when it raised that exception this value error object has one uh, item in the args attribute which is whatever message that python had embedded in that exception right now what i want to do is i want to create an additional message inside that list of arguments right and what i'm going to do is i'm going to say again it's a tuple right so i have the round brackets the first item in that tuple is my custom message and the second item onwards are the old values of that args attribute unpacked i remember telling you that star is used to unpack a collection right like when we when we did zip in the previous module we did star of z to unpack all the tuples in this case i'm using star of args object dot args to unpack all these values so i have a new tuple containing this custom message that i've put and each of the individual values from the old tuple unpacked and now i am just saying raise i am not saying raise this particular exception or that particular exception so if i say raise with nothing after raise then it just re raises the same exception that it caught right but i have also added this message to the args attribute of that uh, exception object so i'll show you how it runs now okay so let me just copy this statement and show you what happens if i run it without any exception handling okay so if i just run this it ask me for a number let's say i type cat which is the wrong kind of input right string is a valid input valid type of input but the value of the string is wrong so i'll say enter and it throws a value error and this is the message that python had wrapped in that value error exception so that's what would happen by default if i had no try and accept right but now if i do have try and accept this error that gets thrown by python has one element in args right it has only one item in the tuple called args which is an attribute of value error 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to catch that object, which is this entire thing. I'm going to create a new value of args, which is the old values appended to this new custom message, right? So now I have two custom messages inside args and I'm re-raising that exception. So if I run it now and I say cat, what I get is a value error with the args printed out, right? Now in this args attribute, first is my custom message and then is the custom is the message that Python had put in the first time it created this value error. So all I'm doing is I'm adding a custom message to this value error and I'm adding it to the original messages that were already there and I'm re-raising this exception. So in a sense, I'm just kind of throwing the same exception. The user will also handle the same kind of exception, but the user will now have a more uh, descriptive understanding of what the issue was. Okay, so that's the second solution. In the first case, we raised a certain kind of exception, right? A generic exception with a specific value. So Python then tells us that I raised this exception while handling the original exception. In the second case, I add to the arguments of the original exception and just re-raise it. And in the third case, I'm going to raise an exception from an exception. So I catch VE, right? And I raise a new exception from VE. So in a sense, I'm kind of chaining exceptions together. So if I do this now, Right? and I run it. Let's say I enter the wrong string value again. Now you can see I have raised this value error with this message right over here. right? That's what gets thrown. And it says that this got thrown because the part above here was the direct cause of that exception, which is here. right? So we originally caught a value error object which was this, right, invalid literal. And you say that particular exception was the direct cause of this new error that got raised, which I did using the raise value error with this custom message from VE, okay? So I've shown you multiple ways of raising exceptions. So I catch the exception in the accept block and then I raise a new exception as in how needed. So let's do some exercises here. Ask the user to input a number between 0 and 10. If the number is less than 0 or greater than 10, raise a value error with the message wrong input. So I'm going to say IP equal to input of, I'm not just input, I'm going to convert that string input into an integer, right? Enter a number between 0 and 10. Okay. So I'll ask the user to enter a number between 0 and 10. And that's stored as a string by the input function. I'm converting that to an integer. So let's just for the sake of uh, simplicity, assume that the user actually enters an integer correctly, right? But we need that value to be between 0 and 10. Now, if the value is not between 0 and 10, raise a value error. So I'll say if IP less than 0 or IP greater than 10, right? Raise value error with the following message. Wrong input. So if I run this now, let's say I enter the value 5 then this clause does not get executed, right? But if I run it again with the value 12, then this condition is true. And so we raise a value error with this custom message here, right? So what I would do in the calling, like for example, let's say I, uh, let's say I put this inside a function, right? Define func that does these things. Okay, and I'm going to, in my calling code, right, like let's say it's run in a separate program, what I would do is I would say try, 
execute func right except value error print ve dot args and then i would say i would handle another like generic except clause saying print So let's just assume this is where I've defined the function and somewhere else separately is where I call the function, right? And in this function documentation, I would have included this doc string saying that uh, accepts a value between 0 and 10 included. Else throws value error right so the user who's reading the documentation of this function knows that it throws a value error so he'll write a try and accept block to handle this value error right so let's do this now i'll execute this block right and the function gets executed it asks for an input let's say i enter five so it runs fine without throwing anything but if i run it again and i throw 15 as the input then it throws a value error, right? And I'm just printing ve.args. Oh, sorry, value error as ve. Rerunning it with the value 15 as the input. So I've printed ve.args in this accept block, right? And I've handled this exception successfully. If I had done star of ve.args, I wouldn't have got a tuple here. I would have got the individual values of the tuple unpacked. You can see that it's just the first string inside the args tuple. Okay, so we've successfully uh, checked if this condition is true and we've thrown this error. And where the person is using this function, we've handled that value error successfully. Ask the user to input a string of length greater than 10. If the length is less than or equal to 10, raise an assertion error with the message, longer message, please. So I'll copy this message here. I'm going to ask the user for an input, right? So IP equal to, I'm going to ask them to input a string. So I don't need to do any conversion. I'll say input, enter a string of length greater than 10. Okay. Now I'm going to say, assert len of ip greater than 10 right if it is greater than 10 i'm fine but if it's not raise an assertion error with this message that's what this code means assert len of ip greater than 10 okay and if it's not throw an assertion error with this message so let me run this I'll just pass test. So it throws an assertion error asking for a longer message, right? So if I now run it again with like a bunch of random code and I pass it, the length of this is obviously greater than 10. So it doesn't throw an assertion error. And finally, ask the user to input a number between 110 and 130, right? If the number is less than 110, raise a value error. While handling the value error, print the message incorrect input and then raise the caught exception. So let's do that, that clause first, right? So ask the user to input a number. So I'll say IP equal to int of input. Enter a number between 110 and 130. So the user inputs a number. I'm converting that number into an integer. And now if num, or sorry, if ip less than 110, I'm going to raise a value error, right? Just value error. And if I, saying raise value error is the same as saying raise value error with open and close empty brackets. So I'm basically passing no custom message over here. Okay. And while handling the value error, do something. So basically I'm saying here, I'm putting this whole thing in a try block. 
right? So if I select, just by the way, if I select all this code and I press shift tab, it reduces the indentation level by one. If I press tab, it increases the indentation level of the entire selected code by one, okay? So I'm, I have my try block where I'm potentially raising a value error. So I'll have an accept block where I'm handling value error. So accept value error. I'm raising the caught exception. So it matters to me what this caught exception object is. So I'm going to print the message incorrect input. And then I'm going to re-raise the caught exception, raise VE. Or I can just say raise. Right? It's the same thing. So if I run this now, and I enter a number between 110 and 130, let's say 120, no error is thrown, right? But if I run it again, and I enter a number 100, then this if condition is true, and I raise a value error, right? But I'm also handling value error. So what I'm doing is I'm first printing this message and then I'm th throwing this exception, the original one. So the, meta, the message gets printed over here and the exception gets thrown over here with no custom message, right? Like I just created a standard value error with no custom message. So if I wanted a custom message, I could have just entered it here saying, custom message of the value error exception. If I run this here and I say 100, it now gets thrown with this custom message. Okay. Now I have another clause. If the number is greater than 130, raise a general exception and add this message to the general exception and raise it. So I'll say If, remember now these if clauses are not related to each other, okay? So if the first one gets executed, anyway we go back to accept. And separately I also check if IP greater than 130 raise a general exception, raise exception, right? And over here I also handle this general exception which is like a catch-all, right? So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm adding this message to the args attribute of the caught exception. So I'll say exception as E, right? Uh, in the previous case, I'm not really using the caught exception, so I'm just going to say value error. Over here, I am using it, like I'm processing it, so I'll capture it as variable E. I'll say... I want to add a message to the args attribute, right? So I'll say e dot args equal to this tuple, right? The first message in this tuple is this new custom message. And the subsequent messages are all the old uh, messages that were already there when I caught the exception. So I'll say, and I'm going to unpack that using star of e dot args. So I'm unpacking that tuple and raise it. So I'll say raise E. So if IP is less than 110, I'm raising a value error, I'm printing a message and I'm re-raising the caught exception. If IP is greater than 130, I'm catching this generic exception, I'm adding a custom message to its args and I'm re-raising it. Okay, so let me now run it again and I'll say the value is 135 which is greater than 130 right so I've raised a general exception here with no with no custom message right and now what I'm doing in here when I catch it is I'm adding this message to its list of arguments so it comes over here and it's getting re-raised right so this whole exception a general exception is getting re-raised Cool. So I've shown you how to look for exceptions 
and handle them using try and accept. You can also have like multiple accept clauses, each accept clause hand handling a different kind of exception. I've shown you what else and finally do. And in this case, I've also shown you how to throw an exception by doing some additional processing before throwing it using the raise keyword or the assert keyword. Okay, so that brings us to the end of module seven, right? On errors and exceptions. So we've covered syntax errors, we've covered runtime exceptions, we've covered how to handle exceptions using try, accept, else, and finally. And we've seen how to throw or raise exceptions using either the raise keyword or the assert keyword. Okay. So see you in the next module, which is module eight, where we'll cover object oriented programming. Great job for sticking with this thus far and keep practicing and all the best.